Gardner, Executive Director of SAVE, and on behalf of the SAVE Board of Directors, I am delighted to welcome you to this evening's presentation, Ian Lockwood, um, who is here to share with us some thoughts about how we can protect our piece of paradise. Tonight, we are honored to have special guests with us. Ronald Bailey, I'm not sure where you are right now, but <laughs> Ronald Bailey, the Executive Director of the Chester County Planning Commission. Matthew Reeder, <laughs> I was talking to Matt about pronunciation of last name, is here from Senator Pelleggi's office. And um, Ricky, where, where are you? Ricky Saunders, <laughs> same founder. And we have a municipal supervisors with us, Bo Alexander from Highland Township, Mike Pickle and David Connors from London Grove Township, and um, Dick Brown from Londonderry Township. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. I also am pleased to welcome <coughs> Gerald Harris, and I'm not sure if he's in the room right now. Ah, Gerald, great. Um, Gerald uh, is the artist who has generously shared his paintings of 41 with us this evening. This is a preview of the Street Road uh, Exhibition 3, Lost Highway 41 in Limited Belief. Uh, and how apropos, the, uh, it, it was um, such, uh, such a serendipitous discovery of the uh, two events happening simultaneously. The street road has an opening tomorrow evening. Um, Hank Williams, uh, from whom um, Gerald gained some inspiration and is featured in the painting over there, um, speaks of a lost highway, a metaphor for a life full of regrets. And we are here tonight so that we don't end up with our lost highway, our road not taken, regretting what we did not do at, to save our precious resources, stunning open spaces from asphalt. Stop for a moment and imagine what 41 in the surrounding area would be like today if 15 years ago, Ricky Saunders had just given up when four lane widening of 41 seemed inevitable. Imagine where we will be in another 15 years if we give up right now. Some think that SAVE is obsolete. Well, I think they are wrong. One has to look no farther than the Chester County Economic Development Council to see how inextricably linked development and roadways are. This is what makes SAVE unique and vital to the conservation efforts of our community. We are promoting innovative transportation design, what Ian will tell us about this evening, that will enable strong communities, economic strength without destroying our resources. We use grassroots advocacy to work with citizens, businesses, and officials at the municipal and state level. Um, together, we are all responsible for determining the fate of 41 and our community. 15 years ago, no one was working on the big elephant in the room, a two-lane Route 41 that was that threatened to be a four-lane Route 41. SAVE was founded to promote safe and sustainable transportation infrastructure that will enhance our communities, strengthen our local economies, and protect our precious natural and historic resources right here in Southern Chester County. This evening, I am honored to present Ian Lockwood, who will show us that there are ways that we can avoid the slippery slope to a legacy of failure. I had an interesting type on Facebook about that. Um, Ian is a livable transportation engineer 
He is the first transportation engineer ever to receive the Loeb Fellowship from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Among his many honors in 2009, his work for the New Jersey Department of Transportation, a project entitled Route 31 Integrated Land Use and Transportation Plan was awarded the Institute of Transportation Engineers Best Project Award. Few practical items. Um, Ian will speak for an hour, roughly, and um, has asked that we hold questions until the end. There will be a time for question and answer after the presentation. Restrooms are through the door where Anthony is standing right now, and then off to the left. And um, as I mentioned earlier, Street Road Gallery does have their opening for um, this exhibition. There are flyers around if you um, haven't seen them, I believe, on the back table. And now, I ask that you please join me in welcoming Ian Lockwood. Hello, everybody. Uh, Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Ian Lockwood. I'm a traffic engineer with a firm called AECOM, um, who bought the little firm I used to belong with um, that did work here about a decade ago. So it's nice to be back. Um, some things have changed. Had, uh, it's interesting, had the uh, two-lane road become a four-lane road in maybe, what, 2003, 2004? Um, it would be going on its 10th anniversary now. So by then, there would have been a number of new subdivisions out here. And you'd probably be arguing about going from four lanes to six lanes now. So it's, it's nice that we're still talking about um, the two-lane road. So, so congratulations on that. Um, so tonight, I have a whole bunch of slides to show you of other projects from around the country. Um, but in the spirit of talking about um, how to fish and the sort of fish, I'm going to go into kind of the, the background so um, that you'll be able to adapt what you see to your context. Um, you'll probably look at all these projects and say, well, that's not like 41. Um, but with a bit of the background, I think you'll be able to adapt them yourself to, to your exact context. Um, another thing, um, I just wanted to say thanks to, to Julie, Lou, and Dennis for touring me around today. That was Wonderful, and as a result, I rearranged my slideshow significantly just before you came in. So um, I'll be going through it at the same time as you, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> unrehearsed. So we'll see how that goes. Um, <coughs> stepping way back for a moment, um, here's our spaceship that we're all on together, flying through the galaxy. And um, just this week, the um, the folks who measure CO2 let us know that for the first time in human history, the um, parts per million of CO2 reached 400. Uh, when I was a kid, when they first started measuring CO2 about 50 years ago, about down here, um, the CO2 was in the 300 range. So it's gone up 100 points in my lifetime. and. The tipping point, according to most scientists, is 450. So if it goes up 50% more than what's happened in my own lifetime, we'll reach a point where our planet can no longer cool down, and it will get very warm. And um, I don't know what will happen, but I can't imagine it'll be very nice. So anyway, that's a pretty serious um, change from when I was born to today. And the question is, what's going to happen um, in the next 25, 20 years? Um, are we going to change the trajectory of that slope or not? Uh, so my conclusion, everyone can draw their own conclusions from this sort of research, but my conclusion is perhaps we ought to try and do something about it um, to make the tra trajectory go down. Um, this is an interesting fact that came out at the same time was that when we put a gallon of gas in our car, when we burn it, it creates 19 pounds of carbon dioxide. So it, yeah, we, we do put a lot out there. And, and then the One Planet Communities was discussing um, that if everybody on the Earth today lived like we do, we would need six planet Earths to survive. 
Unfortunately, we only have one and we've got to make do. So um, something ought to, ought to give. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's just because of that news this week that way I introduced that idea. But I'm going to start with um, walkable environments. And this, this really has to do with the towns in the area. Um, there's, there's three ingredients that create walkable environments, even if it's just something as simple as a beach. Um, beach has sky, water, backdrop, and the beach. Very simple, but very walkable. And it's walkable for three reasons. One is comfortable. You, you feel at ease walking on the beach. Two, it can hold your interest. It's engaging, and it's accessible. You can actually, oh, the light just burnt out. All right. I guess we're not going to use the light. <laughs> so we're going to just move that out of the way. Yeah, the bulb went pop. So, um, so those are the three ingredients that are common to any walkable environment. Now, cities, towns, and villages need more characteristics than a beach to be considered walkable. They need to be convenient. And what I mean by that is that the things you need on a daily basis need to be close at hand so you can get them easily. And then they need to be connected, usually with a street network, so you can, um, can, can you get to them. Now, a main street, you know, the key little street in the village or the town, wants to be vibrant. And we're going to talk about that um, in detail in a few minutes. The history of transportation, the technology of transportation has shaped cities for a long, long time. When water and boats were the main transportation uh, mode, cities developed at the junctions of rivers and rivers and rivers and oceans. They wanted to be at those intersections for efficient exchange, and that's why we developed at those, at those intersections. And in larger cities, when vertical transportation elevators were invented, cities could grow up more than three to five stories, which was how high you were willing to walk. And then when the trains and trolleys came along, we could develop into the, um, into the landscape, um, and we could develop at the junction of railways and railways. And so up to the end of the trolley era, we had very vibrant cities. So here's Richmond, Virginia, and look at all that social exchange and economic exchange going along their main street, which is Broad Street. Uh, there's walking, trolleys, cars. It's very, very what we call vibrant. And this is why it was vibrant. Um, this, is, this is their main street downtown, Richmond. And all these black lines represent trolley lines. And everybody was in the close walk of a trolley line. So they, through their city design and their transportation strategy, they rewarded the short trip, the walking trip, or the transit trip. And it resulted in a very, very nice city. <coughs> now here's a little village. Um, this one's in New Jersey. and. Um, it's highly walkable, but just into, into a little teeny core there called Stockton. And then there's big cities like Detroit. Um, again, walkable um, and transit-friendly city. Lots of vibrancy going on. There's a theater and there's downtown. They have beautiful, um, beautiful social exchange going on. And one of the reasons why Detroit was such a, a wonderful city was because of its street network, highly connected. Um, street network and they had, uh, they had transit. So it doesn't matter if you have a teeny weeny little village or a city of two million people. It can be um, you know, very vibrant. And it's part of the reason is these different types of connected street networks that which bring them together. The other component is this convenience idea that we talked about, the, the mixing of land uses. Now, we always talk about the work trips in, in my profession, um, but work trips only account for maybe 20% of our, of our trip making. The other 80%, the vast majority of, tri of our trip making have to do with shopping, recreation, visiting friends, that kind of thing. So if we can get those land uses close together in our villages and so forth, it means lots of short trips, which is far more sustainable than uh, long trips. So it doesn't matter if you're in your little town, you can um, create a very nice uh, mixed-use environment or a big city with the same sort of thing. The principles apply to any scale of hamlet, village, or city. <coughs> in the old days, all of our streets operated at the, at the same speed. Didn't matter if it was an arterial road, 
or a local street, they all operated at four to six miles an hour, which is how fast your horse walked, because the horse didn't really care if it was on an arterial street or a local street. And consequently, retail could be up to the street, housing could be up to the street, and it was a very modern idea to speed those roads up in cities. And where we have sped them up, what happened? You know, the retail pulled away, it became a barrier, nobody wanted to live there anymore. Arterials used to be the best address in town. The people my age or older remember going downtown to the department stores and the, and the wonderful main streets and, and doing all sorts of things. But as the um, fashion changed in transportation, we started speeding them up. Malls came, um, and which, which damaged the downtowns, and, um, and the arterial streets became car conduits. So these are the, what, what we call traditional values. These are the values that have governed the design of cities and towns for centuries. You know, short trips, where the bigger cities have transit, walkable proximity, uh, mixing of land uses, a good network, access, buildings addressing streets and slower speeds. And the outcome was vibrancy. And this is something that we should strive for in all our little towns and cities. Fundamentally, the purpose of the, the city. Now, when I say city, just <coughs> pretend it also means town, hamlet, village. The purpose of built places is to advance efficient and effective exchange. Cities are an efficiency thing to bring folks together for the exchange of goods, services, labor, entertainment, social contact. It, we want to gather in cities and towns to do that, as opposed to spreading out all over the countryside, where it makes it very difficult and expensive and energy hungry to do exchange. So the transportation of cities, towns, villages, and so forth is to minimize long distance travel. It's to, it's to create short trips. The land use purpose of cities is to gather the ingredients of civic life into the city so that, it, so that exchange can happen. And then the purpose of the countryside was always to nurture the planet. It's to provide the food, the resources um, for us and habitat for, for other creatures. So the litmus test for the built environment has always been, does the change reward the short trip or the transit trip? And so when we do our, our work, whether it's in a rural area, a, a village, a, a city, if the answer is yes, we know it's a good idea, and if it's no, it, it probably is not a good idea. Remember this diagram? Now when the car came along, the city, the, the town could grow anywhere you could build a street, which was just about anywhere. But something else happened at the end of the trolley area. It wasn't just the car coming along. It was what we're going to call modernism. And modernism brought a lot of wonderful things to our lives. You know, modern dance, modern furniture, modern music, modern sculpture. Well, modern architecture, maybe. <laughs> but um, I don't know if you're a fan of modern architecture. But anyway, it brought all these new possibilities to us. And um, one of the themes of modernism was to simplify things. It was to reject the old, reject the traditional, and replace that with a, a sim simpler um, way of doing things, a better way of doing things in the imagination of the advocates of modernism. And folks like Cabousier came up with all these um, uh, ideas about how cities ought to be built um, to be better than they had been built the last 5,000 years. And he came up with these um, kind of tower in the park type places. And he was enamored with the car and the speed it could provide. And, and so one of his famous quotes, cars, cars, fast, fast. And so here's his imagination. Here's the object in the landscape. And, and the idea of, for streets was to just connect the objects in the landscape. What was along the way wasn't important. He kind of rejected that, as, you know, the fabric of, of the area. It was just a matter of connecting things. And, and then they extrapolated that into the future. And the idea was that you see these objects in the landscape, and you go through these conduits to get there. And, and proximity wasn't important anymore. And, you can, and this captured folks' imaginations. And, and you got these wild sort of space age type ideas of, again, objects in the landscape. 
And, and nothing was beyond the reach of modern ideas. So you could visit the Grand Canyon, down one of these things, um, or go to Egypt and visit the, the Sphinx. And the, the role of streets was dumbed down to a binary idea. It was either for mobility, like throughput, or for access to land. Now, we all know that streets have the capacity to do all sorts of things besides that. Um, nurture businesses, pr provide social places, to create identity for your, your, your town. Streets have all sorts of functions, not just those two things. So you can imagine, um, this is kind of the modernist view of what a street does, and this is what the you know, traditional values would say a street does. So far, far more um, rich. Now, modernism just didn't stop with the designers and the architects. Um, the industrialists uh, got behind it because they saw a great amount of profit in it. And so Henry Ford said, we'll, s we'll solve the problem of the city by leaving the city. And so he intended to build these big highways and export populations out into, um, into the landscape. And that became the suburbs. And then in uh, Gettys in 1939, the World's Fair in New York came up with Futurama. And, and that was like the tipping point where particularly my profession embraced modernist ideas and um, worked them into our funding sources with, for the gas tax, into our structure with the MPOs and the federal funding. Um, with our measures of effectiveness, like levels of service and delays, and, and to our design of streets with the strict hierarchy of streets from highways to arterials to collectors and so forth. So it, it completely influenced my profession. And it was also the time of the, the expert. And the expert was to um, guide society. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't up to the people. And so the idea was, if it can't be measured, it doesn't exist or is of no value. The affairs of citizens are, are best conducted by experts, so you, you don't really have a say. And, and this, this sort of attitude was um, what allowed highways to get plowed through cities and neighborhoods and all sorts of things. And here's one of such expert, Henry Barnes, who's a very influential traffic engineer, and he, he was the one who, who amongst other things, um, got rid of those horrible streetcars in Baltimore. Interestingly, um, people like him got rid of streetcars all over North America, and now we're spending billions of dollars putting them back, you know, realizing it was a, a grave error. That's a seatbelt, and I don't know if anybody here thinks it's a good idea to have a seatbelt. Yeah, most people? Okay. Well, there was a, a group, a very powerful group, who said the possible benefits of required seatbelts would not justify the cost to the manufacturers and the public. This is in the 70s. Anybody guess who that might have been? General Motors, any other? Ford, all the car companies? Well, it was the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. <laughs> now, so sometimes the experts get it wrong. And um, I would suggest that in my profession, we, you know, with hindsight, uh, we got a number of things wrong. Uh, a lot of it was um, placed in, in books, like Traffic and Towns. This was on my bookshelf when I started traffic engineering. And it was a very sort of modernist leaning uh, book. And you know, segregating traffic was key. So highways were just about moving folks through. They didn't have other functions. And this was, this, these values were encapsulated in a lot of our technical documents, which we still use today. Um, so the, the point is that we're still up against the sort of modernism when most of our sensibilities say otherwise. And, and here's the, um, the values of the modernists. To, to reward the long trips, it's all about the cars. S speed is important. Um, connecting objects in the landscape, single use type developments, large subdivisions or other objects. Uh, the dendritic street hierarchy that arterials are for just moving cars, not for other purposes. And congestion is just bad. Um, cities have been congested since you know, Roman times and suddenly it, it became a bad thing because it, it, it fit with the modernist idea. And the outcome was diminished vibrancy and sprawl. That was tended to be the outcome everywhere it got applied. And you can see the cities that applied it with gusto. Um, Detroit is the poster child of modernist thinking. And look what happened to it. Um, Houston, um, Phoenix, Las Vegas. 
uh, all very, very expensive um, um, infrastructure for very poor vibrancy <laughs> results. And then you can see cities that did more traditional methods uh, became better cities. Um, Portland, Vancouver, uh, Washington, those sorts of places. Now, the modernist thinking is appealing on the individual level, which is very appealing to Americans because we value our individual freedoms and so forth. So that's what they were playing to. So moving along in your car quickly to an individual is better than moving along slowly. So doesn't it make sense that if everybody could drive quickly, then that would be a good thing? So wouldn't it be great if the entire place could drive quickly? And it's one of these huge tragedy of the commons type thing. Like if everybody does it, it harms the environment for all of us. And the attempt to speed up cities for motorists ubiquitously uh, worsen the environment in the cities, devaluing them and exporting the value, people and investment out to the suburbs. And you can see the cities that did this the most have typically have the most um, suburban type development. So this is the city of West Palm Beach. This is where I was in the city transportation um, head for a number of years and we had modernists running the division I was in charge of ever since the Second World War. And, and what they did before I got there was they sped up all our streets, they widened them, they made them one way and, and everybody left the city into the suburbs down these streets and became car dependent and then drove back and we tore down half our fabric buildings to make room for parking lots, eroding the quality of the city. We had 80% vacancies on our main shopping street. Um, we had $7,000 in reserves as a city. We were, we were broke. HBO did their documentary on drug abuse in the United States and they filmed it in West Palm Beach. Uh, it was called Undercover USA Crack America. And um, we had a, a legendary prostitution and drug problem. And nobody walked, it was, nobody invested, there was no development going on. So when I got there, this is what I came up with. There's boarded up buildings, empty parking lots, more boarded up buildings. And this is where everybody went. Thanks to these big arterial roads, they left the city and went to these large suburban track home developments, the object in the landscape. And, um, and then, of course, bombed the city with their cars afterwards. So um, it, it was a real hardship on us. Um, so we did a, a master plan. We got everybody together, um, all the citizens, all the neighborhood groups, all the business folks, and we came up with a, a plan. And this is exactly the opposite of the modernist thinking. So here's Jefferson's quote. Um, the ultimate powers of the society needs to reside with the people. If we don't think they're enlightened enough to exercise their control with wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it away from them, but to inform their discretion. And so that's what tonight's about. Um, it's not to give up 41 to um, the Department of Transportation or anybody else or developers. Uh, it's to create a common vision for it amongst the community and have that be the future of 41, not have it imposed on you by outsiders or, or experts. So this is what we did. Um, there's different types of stakeholder in involvement and this is what conventionally happens in um, sort of highway expansion type projects is you just get informed what's happening to you. And the idea in West Palm Beach was we would do more than that. We would, we would involve and collaborate and empower the community to guide the future of the city. So it's a very active type of in involvement. And consequently, we had a huge buy-in, which was a mandate to the, to the politicians to actually implement what was come up with in the, in the planning. So we drew the plan, we drew what we think thought the city ought to be like, and then we codified it in our, um, our ordinances. So my job was to make the streets match this wonderful uh, vision that everyone had come up with. And this is, <laughs> this is Dixie Highway, and it was just a hostile car conduit cutting through the place and empty buildings all around. You can see the weeds growing out of the broken windows up there of that vacant building. And all my training was modernist in, and I'd only been out of school 10 years. I really didn't know what to do. <laughs> but I knew I couldn't keep doing what we had been doing. Something had to change. And so 
I decided to narrow Dixie Highway down to two lanes from three and raise the intersections to help pedestrians cross the street, put in some nice sidewalks. And lo and behold, somebody now occupies the building. It's in interesting when you make a really cool place that's walkable, investment comes in, uh, people come back. And all the, all the um, fear-mongering about how the congestion which we had was going to get worse when we narrowed the road never happened. Um, the models got it dead wrong. Um, the congestion didn't get any worse, even though I took away half the, or sorry, 50% of the, the lanes. And this is um, another one of the big state arterials um, coming to town. Um, it goes right through a college. There's the dorms for the, um, the college. The college was going to build these pedestrian flyovers. This road was so hostile, big concrete things. And instead, um, we worked with the college and the Florida Department of Transportation and various um, neighborhood folks. And we came up with a plan to shrink the street, beautify it, and do these things like raised crossings for the to students. And that actually glued the campus back together, added value to the, to the whole context, and um, saved a ton of money as well. So we got an increased tax base and didn't spend taxpayers' money on building this enormous um, road or with the, uh, or have the flyovers. Um. This is North Dixie Highway, and we were doing a utility project. And so we thought, well, why don't we change this street while we're at it? And there was a lot of domestic violence and stabbings and all kinds of boarded up homes and empty property over here. We thought, well, uh, maybe we could make it nicer if we, if, we, if we made the public realm nice. So we took this high-speed car conduit and turned it into a two-lane street with lateral shifts. If you look closely, you see that tower, that smokestack? That's that same smokestack. And we put a linear park down it. And people started to walk. They started to ride bikes. The kids could walk to school for the first time in decades. And the boards came off homes, um, development moved in because we made the street environment so pleasing. And, and then the crime rates went down. This is um, an empty building on our main street with nothing going on on the ground floor. Um, we gave a facade grant to the owner of this building and he, and it looks like that now, and he fixed up the inside by himself and um, now there's a waiting list to, to move there. And on the ground floor there's this wonderful restaurant and so where the, the prostitutes used to hang out, now they can enjoy a nice lunch um, <laughs> at that building. So this is downtown. This is exactly where Crack America was filmed. And there's the old high school, which we, we saved from the wrecking ball. And then we, um, we came up with a plan. I had, to do, I had to do the streets. And then, boom, it's a mixed-use development now. So I went from that to that. And it's, what, three or four stories? housing, shops, theaters, restaurants. Um, the model said that I had to um, put left turn lanes at this intersection. But this is like the 100% corner in, our, in this area. And I thought it was too important to make it a nice place to, to put in the turn lanes. So I didn't put in the left turn lanes. And it's a beautiful place. And the models predicted that there would be some backups and things. And no problem. Uh, nobody minds. Um, it's such a great place that people expect to go a little more slowly when they go through here. It's not about speed when you're here anymore. You've arrived when you're here. Here's another example. Um, modernists have built a highway into Milwaukee. And um, this is the highest and best use of the waterfront at the time, was surface parking. And um, this is what it looked like. Notice how similar it is to Cabousier's drawing of connecting objects in the park. There it is. <laughs> and the city took those modernist ideas and replaced them with traditional ideas of network, uh, slower speeds, took down the highway, and now they're, this is their vision and they're implementing it and it's turning Milwaukee into a really nice place with investment coming back to the city. There's Detroit, I showed you that earlier. This is what they did to it. Um, they built I-375 through and widened all the roads. Um, it had a very slumming effect on the traditional city. Va all the value left out to Wayne County. Everybody moved out who could. All that, all that exchange that was going on, the social and economic exchange dried up. Look at that beautiful theater. See those columns? Those are the same columns. 
They turned the theater into a parking garage, and there's the stage. So it's, it's literally a metaphor for Detroit and the modernist movement. So there's the network, and there's what it is today. And you can see how they, they've severed the connections and the convenience of the city with the, the highways and the tower and the parks. Um, Detroit embraced modernism. They were the richest city around after the Second World War because they built so much stuff and um, thought modernism was the way to go, and they ended up destroying themselves. So we're working now with Michigan DOT and um, some foundations and so forth to take out I-375 and restore Hastings Street and the network and to connect the old uh, Eastern Market and make the city whole again. So traditional values, again, are replacing modernist values to bring life back to the community. Remember Richmond? Well, they had traditional values until 1949 when they replaced them with modernist values and that scene turned to this one today. There's no social exchange and economic exchange going down that street. There's two universities and it's the capital city. You think it would be a vibrant street, but it's not. There's still lots of traffic, but they're long trips. They don't stop. There's no, there's no exchange going on. So they rewarded the wrong thing. They rewarded the long trip. So I just want to go through these value sets, because this is what it's about. It's about your values versus other people's values. This is the modernist conventional values, this traditional values. The higher calling for the modernists is to, to follow what the, the models, the trap demand models say. Um, the traditional value is to follow what the community is interested in. The focus of modernists is to reward long trips, automobile trips only. The traditional values to accommodate many different users and reward short trips. The definition of the problem typically from conventional thinkers is to fight congestion and speed things up. Traditionally, it's to advance community priorities and make great places. The land use relationship, the modernists, that, that was, that's the details. We don't look at, we don't worry about that. Um, traditionally, it was integrated. The complexity, modernism is inherently simple. Traditional thinking is more complex, multi-layered. This, this one you're very familiar with, this key strategy of the modernists is to, um, to add lanes. The traditional thinkers are, are about safe speeds, increasing access, um, shortened trips. The capacity of streets in modernist views is to just to move traffic. Traditionally, streets have the capacity to nurture businesses, increase social interaction, and add character. I've heard so much from this community about how they cherish their character, and, and, and these Paintings around this room kind of indicate where the character is going with the more modernist thinking. And the typical outcomes of modernist thinking is lack of identity, poor health, car dependency, and traditionally it's the, the other things. There's more options, better health, strong identity, less energy use. But most importantly here, I think, it's the sprawl and the devalued cities and towns and villages that come out of modernist thinking as opposed to this much stronger, healthier idea of town and country. Um, you know, you used to have these little distinct towns along the way and then farms in between. And that's a very powerful um, idea and, and, and vision. So I would argue that the purpose of cities is still to advance efficient and exchange, effective exchange. The transportation is to still minimize long distance travel. The land use purpose is to concentrate the components of life. And the countryside is, the purpose is still to nurture the planet. I don't think these things, these ideas that have been around for thousands of years actually fell out of fashion with the modernist movement. I think they're, they're as applicable today as they ever were. So again, that litmus test I think is applicable now. Does the change reward the short trip and the transit trip? So when you see a development coming you know, randomly into the landscape, um, now you have a litmus test and a value set from which to judge it. Um, you know, kind of fundamentally, and then you can get into the details. Usually we argue about the details, but behind the scenes we're arguing about which paradigm we believe in. So if, if you agree with the traditional paradigm, I think you're better equipped now than you were when you're going against a modernist paradigm. You know where the other, the opponent's coming from. I want to talk a little bit more about vibrancy, because this is important for the little towns along the way. So here's two streets. Um, we're going to look at average trip lengths. I'm going to just widen them up so you can see them. These are per 10 streets. Um, and these red lines represent trip lengths. So 
So you can see the trips on the left street are shorter than these ones. These are long trips. So if you measure them, the average trip here is a mile. The average trip there four miles. So there's four times more trip making going on on this side. Now if you put a couple tubes across the street and counted the cars, there's only three cars everywhere here. So from a traffic volume perspective, everything is identical. But there's four times more trip making going on here. Four times more social exchange, four times more vibrancy, four times, 400% more efficient um, use of land than here. Same volume though. And my profession only typically measures volume. We, we're not interested in the trip length. So if you're a dentist going to work and you go through 200 intersections, it has so much value to society. If you go, if, the same, if a different dentist goes to, through two intersections, there's the same value to society for the trip, but one has a 100 times the public subsidy to, to make the trip compared to the short trip. One is far more sustainable, one is far more tax friendly, one is far more energy friendly than the other. And that's what we're getting at with rewarding the short trip. So here's a little town, let's say, and there's the main street. Let's do a count. There's 18,000 cars on each street. Let's pretend on the left, the average trip length is two, and the average trip length over there is six. So there's three times the trip making here, even though the volumes are identical. So this is probably far more vibrant, far more livable. People have far more friends. The business is probably far more successful, probably three times more successful, actually, than over here. But from a volume perspective, we think they're identical situations. Let's change it up a little bit. Let's say there's a policy here to speed up through traffic. That's, that's the, the mission of the transportation folks. So they've, they've um, denied left turns um, and maybe put in a couple one-way streets. So let's say because they've rewarded longer trips, it's attracted more trips to that um, street, and now there's 20,000 trips instead of 18. On the other hand, over here, let's say they had a um, a different approach that they were rewarding short trips. So let's say they put parking on uh, some of the streets and um, maybe bulb outs to help pedestrians. Now there's 15,000 cars. It went down. But the trip lengths changed. So when you, when you actually do the math, there's now six times more trip making here. Far, far more vibrant. And so if you're looking to invigorate your towns and villages and cities here, Think about the average trip length. Think about the design of the street and what it's rewarding and what it isn't. Is it pro-trip or is it pro-through traffic, long trip? It, it's hugely important and, um, and far more efficient, cost-effective, um, beneficial on, 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 on subsidies, public subsidies, taxes, and that sort of thing. This is called the transportation land use cycle, and you can kind of start anywhere. But let's assume you widen the road. Um, here you add vehicle capacity, um, which increases access to the area, which increases land value. So the land uses change, which makes more trips, which creates a greater need for driving. So you widen the road, increases accessible to the area, the land uses value up, and so, you know, it just keeps going and going and going until um, some other cycles start to come in. As you keep widening roads, the, the environment along the street may get worse. The streets may become mobility oriented and you actually get denied access you know, pro through medians, turn prohibitions. So land values start to drop again and then you get a negative land use change and a worse environment. And you can see that happening you know, in, in places you know, here and everywhere else around the country. When this happens, there's less pedestrians and less cyclists, less green space, the quality of life starts to deteriorate. So people relocate away from those places and then, then they become car dependent. And so. The idea here is to not accept this anymore, but to, to change it and start a trajectory of reinvesting in your towns so they become great places to live and takes the pressure off the countryside. Transportation planning and land use planning used to be done separately. Um, in some places, it's, it's still done that way. In fact, the transportation department is completely separate from the land use department. It might be even in a, in a different building. And these folks worry about things like forecast models. These folks worry about other things. And, and the outcomes aren't usually very good. Um, what's happening more and more in enlightened places is that the land use planning and transportation planning happen simultaneously. Now, we call it community planning. Some people call it smart growth. 
It doesn't really matter what you call it, um, but the outcomes are healthier. You, um, uh, it's more sustainable. It's, e it's, it's easier on the, um, the tax burden and that sort of thing. So here's, here's, here's another pattern that we've noticed. Here's if you widen the road. In school, I was taught if you widen the road, you reduce delays and you reduce costs. But when you actually look in the real world, what goes on, there's these, that's first order thinking. There's other consequences. As you reduce delays and reduce costs, people drive further, they drive more, and the retailing and so forth tends to respond to match the infrastructure. So you see big box retailing coming in and this kind of thing, which displaces local entrepreneurship. Profits leave town, um, you get more strip, and so it, it has some, some very negative consequences if you keep widening roads. Now in school, I was taught if you accept congestion, you're going to get more delays and more costs. But when you see cities that have what I would call a more mature attitude towards congestion, other modes of transportation start to be used more, people drive less, Main Street stay vibrant, there's less vehicle miles traveled, and investment comes to the community. So, and you could probably think of all sorts of communities around the country or elsewhere that you see these patterns happen. You recognize this? This is not a flag of a third world country. It's a picture of some of the most fertile soils in the country right here in your backyard. You know, beautiful, beautiful area where you live. Unique, um, just uh, you know, breathtakingly spectacular. Yeah, we could frame these and put them around the wall, you know, too. They're just so nice. And so this is, this is what's in the, the balance. Um, so when we were here last time, it was, it was all about the threat of this widening of the Route 41. And this was what the DOT was studying at the time to make four lanes. And this is what the vision was. And, you know, you, you kind of know what the story would be. And now I've heard that they're not planning to widen the road to four lanes, but when we went on our tour today, I did not see any evidence of embracing a two-lane future of the street. I didn't see one single change that indicated that the two-lane alternative was the preferred idea. However, I saw the opposite, and I saw lots of indications that the road is being four-laned quietly and in little pieces. Um, now, there's probably all sorts of excuses why every single change that's happened since I've been here last looks like a four-lane road, um, but isn't part of a plan to make a four-lane road. But I don't think anybody in the room is an idiot. You know, we can see that this culvert replacement here has been designed so that a four-lane road can go through there easily. And then it's a matter later of connecting the dots. And so, now can you imagine this place had this been a, you know, how much money got spent on that, first of all? Um, now, if it were just a two-lane street, instead of building this huge thing, maybe some, it would be cool, had some bridge architecture being put in there, like some of those cool stone Amish bridges that are around here, with some nice edges, maybe even a little um, acknowledgement that there's water flowing under here. <laughs> Like water is going to be the defining issue of the century and we're pretending it doesn't even exist by making this flat interstate highway over it and it was well, not interstate sorry I don't shouldn't exaggerate um, but this four lane highway maybe maybe we could raise the bar a little on this and, and not say we don't have plans to make a four lane road and then paint out what's obviously a, uh, a trajectory for a four lane road. So I think we could use the same money or less and do a much more context sensitive job of it uh, for future projects. This picture was taken last time I was here. I think there's a Walmart on top of that now. Um, and then there was a discussion about what was going to happen at the interchange with, with Highway 1. And this was the imagination of the time. Um, again, very land consumptive uh, type ideas. And then there was this cool document that we saw which imagined the, the area somewhat like we're talking about tonight, um, you know, preserving what, what we all enjoy. And what we talked about last time was how to work with the DOT, um, when to work with them, um, the different in, difference in perspectives. Once your street is improved, the curve will be right here. You know, she has one perspective, he has another. Um, this is your community. 
And then what happens if we keep our head in the sand? Um, it'll, that those patterns we see everywhere else will happen here. And we'll all say, gee, well, not too bad. And then we talked about trucking. And um, huge issue in the area, there's where we are. And there's the average distance that a truck goes in a, in a day. Somewhere in this area, it's like three or 400 miles. So that's, that's kind of the catchment area for, for trucking in a day. And the idea is that, well, maybe um, they don't all have to go on 41. Maybe there's a way to help the trucks go on um, other routes. So this was the SAVES vision back in the day. And this was what we coined as PennDOT's vision. Now, PennDOT is a different organization today than they were a decade ago. I, I would say that they're a better organization. They're more enlightened. But that being said, um, the evidence on the ground indicates that they're still interested in, in building a four-lane road. So we're not out of the woods with them yet. But uh, they, they have come a long way. Here's, here's your area in 1993, mostly farms, some little towns and stuff. And there it is today. And you can see the, the encroachment, the um, sprawl working its way up the highways towards uh, your area. So the, what I would call the pioneer plants for growing sprawl is a sort of business as usual lack of vision and lack of predictability. Vision means that you have a, a collective consensus on where, this, where the area should be going. Predictability means you have a plan on how to get there. And that seems to be uh, lacking still. So there's this friction between what folks want and what other people want. Um, the second one is wider and faster farm to market roads. Whenever we see these old farm to market roads, like 40, start to resemble highways, it's a pretty good bet that um, folks are going to rezone their property and build uh, tract home developments and so forth along the way. The planner's gift, we call it. These are, are rezonings where value is added to someone's property with nothing coming back for the public welfare. And so the, the cost is, and the profit is totally one way. And the profit comes from somewhere. You know, as long as there's profit to be made by turning beautiful landscapes into tract housing, people are going to be trying to do that. And if we keep giving away zoning with nothing coming back, um, this is what we're going to get, sprawl. And then um, the extensions of utilities. These are the, when you see these things sort of happen, you, you know where the trajectory is going. Um, now, you'll also hear that, well, all of this is necessary for economic development and growing a tax base to, to help pay for things, the streets, the schools, and, and what have you. But when you actually do the math and look at it um, from, from more than just a narrow perspective, you'll find it's, that sprawl is, in fact, the most expensive way you can develop. It's a very flawed economic development strategy. And here's just, um, for every dollar a county makes on a single family home in, in, the, in the county, in, in the towns and villages, you, you get almost four times the, the, the money per, per acre. Malls and Walmarts and that kind of thing generate probably seven times the value than a per acre than a single family home. And then you get into um, sort of mixed use in towns, and then you get into sort of bigger cities. But the, the multiplier of developing in an urban way instead of a suburban way is, is gigantic. And when you, when you look at this, the, what you'll find is the the ways you entice this sort of development requires huge public subsidies, building sewer lines, water lines, um, streets, at our expense. And um, now the addiction, the reason that jurisdictions do this is to get the fees, the permit fees, the big income, because the costs of maintaining sprawl exceeds the revenues. The taxes aren't high enough to pay for this. So the, we need these permit fees, so we've got to keep, we've got to keep the engine ticking over. And the, the infrastructure per capita is just too high. Every one of us owns so much road that we have to maintain, and those, the taxes to maintain that infrastructure are much higher in a suburban model than in a town or village model. And that's why it's, it's not a good business model. So your choices in the long run 
are either high taxes or disinvestment. And what we've chosen in most places is disinvestment. You, know, you can see there's a lot of bridges in Pennsylvania and other places that aren't being maintained. There's, there's plenty of infrastructure that's falling apart that was, when it was shiny and new, was fine when the suburbs were first starting to get built. But now, now we're getting the rub of having to um, fix these things. Not to mention the health outcomes, the, the energy issues, the CO2, and so forth. You know, just our, our own sort of money thing just doesn't work out. So now I'm going to show you some case studies. I'm going to go through these pr pretty quickly. Um, this is a project we did a while ago to restore part of the Bronx River Parkway. And, um, to understand it, we need to talk a little bit about um, context or transect. And so if you took a meat cleaver and cut through a town and you went into the suburbs and into the rural areas, you would get you know, taller buildings closer together in the, in the sort of the urban area. Uh, buildings a little further apart in the suburbs, and then in the rural area, they're very far apart. There's more pedestrians in towns and cities, and fewer as you go rural. In cities, you'll find regularly spaced trees in grates. In the rural areas, you'll find forests. In the suburbs, you'll find something in between. In cities, you'll find, in towns, you'll find pedestrian scale lighting. In the suburbs, you find cobra head lighting. In the rural areas, probably no lighting. You have higher quality paving materials in urban areas and, and lesser as you go towards gravel and dirt in rural areas. Formal edge treatments in urban areas and informal shoulders and so forth as you go rural. Low speeds in cities and towns, medium speeds in the suburbs and high speeds in rural areas. Marked parking in cities, informal parking in the suburbs and off street parking in rural areas. And wide sidewalks, narrow sidewalks and then and trails. And the what I'm trying to get at here is if you're designing something in a town, in one of your little villages, this is the design vocabulary that you should be looking for. If you're designing something in a rural area, that's the design vocabulary. The, the problem with a lot of the little towns around here from a design perspective is that whoever designed them imported suburban and rural values into the town. Like the lights are too high or the speeds are too fast for the towns and it, and it devalues the town and, and, and makes the businesses hard to, to run. Similarly, you can't, imp you can't export values out of the urban areas into the rural areas either. So towns should look like that and rural areas should look like this. So getting back to the Bronx River Parkway, here's the Bronx River Parkway. It, um, it used to be a fabulous route through the countryside where you can enjoy a, a, like a Sunday drive. There's only one little piece of it that is worthy of preservation now. The rest has been turned into a big freeway. And um, so it used to be industrial, and the water in the Bronx River got so polluted it was killing the animals in the Bronx Zoo. Um, so they decided to do something about it. They tore it all down and did this huge public works effort and built these beautiful parks. They moved um, thousands of cubic yards of soil to create beautiful views as you're driving through, um, setting up these. Uh, landscapes and you know, huge, huge efforts. So now the, the, the water became clean, it became a great recreational place and people just loved it. All these fantastic bridges, all unique um, along the parkway. And um, of course these need maintaining and today the, that architecture is not valued and so they've got this sort of modern concrete kind of interpretation <laughs> of what used to be there with guardrail instead of the stone wall. So it kind of devalued the, the, the bridge and the, the guardrails on top. And then things started to get faster and they started doing a lot of signing. You know, the scale of the signs got large. And this intersection, I, I won't go through the whole preservation effort, but this intersection was kind of telling. Back in the day, folks would leisurely drive their cars through here. And um, some of these side streets became places where people could develop. And so traffic volumes started to go up and started rutting the road. So they, they, they repaved the road, but never milled it down. And there used to be a curb along the side. And they, they filled it up with asphalt over time until there was no curb reveal. And so then they needed to build shoulders. So they cut down the trees on the side to build um, shoulders. And then speeds went up. Um, and volumes went up even further, and so they needed to signalize the place. 
And um, so they added turn lanes, you know, making the road wider. And then when the signals went in, that meant the traffic had to stop. And when the traffic stopped, it had to queue up. So the queue started to back up. And then there was crashes. So the drivers coming over this hill would crash into the back of the queue. And so the engineer said, well, then we've got to cut down these hills now um, to make them flat. And so slowly but surely, this beautiful resource was being turned into an interstate <laughs> highway. And um, you know, it was one increment at a time. It was like this, this tra negative trajectory. And, and it started looking like this. And so we, our thought was, well, why don't we just restore it, like put it back? And so the plan is to put back the curbs, put back the trees, put back the historic lighting, put back the, the stone, make it two lanes again. And at the intersections, um, put in roundabouts, because you don't need all those extra lanes for storing cars and turning and stuff. And so you can get back to the intent. And then you don't have to tear down the hills that were put in purposely to create a wonderful um, experience. So that's the, that's the plan. This is a little town in Texas. That's the main street. You can see it's kind of got disinvested in. Um, this is the square, the main square with the courthouse. Um, again, uh, nothing going on. Uh, this is actually a state truck route going through here, um, the one-way streets. That's what it used to look like. It used to be very vibrant. And there's, they turned the square into a parking lot to compete with the suburbs. And so the one-way street comes through here, down like that, and the other direction it comes up like this. So it's all one way. And we, we helped the city reinvent this, and we built this square. And we two-wayed all the streets. We took the parking out of the middle and put it on on-street parking. Before, this is their, one of their memorials. Um, it's, it was in the middle of the parking lot. So when we did the project, we had to take him away. And then we came back afterwards, we put him back in. And now he's got a nice spot in the square. And the veterans can go and visit their statue um, with some pride instead of going into a parking lot. Um, so these are the kinds of things that you can do in your little towns if the public realm, if the streets are designed accordingly. And there's our, our veterans, our big veterans memorial. Now this is just for fun, it has nothing to do with the talk, but there's, um, we had to build bathrooms as part of the splash pad. So there's the bathroom. It's made out of mirrors. So it, building a bathroom is really tricky, but if you make it out of mirrors, it looks just like the rest of the square, right? <laughs> so um, it fit in perfectly. But these aren't ordinary mirrors. Um, there's a girl trying to look in at her friend. Um, now, you can see out, but you can't see in. So you can see this guy's taking a picture of her, and that's, there she is looking in. So when you're going to the bathroom, you can actually see everybody around you, but, but they, they can't see you. Anyway, it's kind of a cool thing. Um, but more importantly, the, um, the streets are completely flush, so when there are events, um, they can spill out into the street. They have flexible space. So I don't know if all your little towns have town squares where you can have events, but if they don't, maybe making these flush streets um, can create a, a public space for, for big events. And lo and behold, investment started coming back. People came back and investment came back. This is a new candy shop. This is the old empty um, drugstore. And, and there it is getting fixed up to become a restaurant and, and some lofts. So investment's coming in. Now I'm showing this because trucking is a big issue here and it was there as well. There's a lot of trucks going through that area. And there's, um, the trucking is coming through here for a number of reasons. And a big one is the GPS systems of those um, that the trucks use to route, the, route them around. Tell them to come through here. It's the quickest way to wherever they're going. And um, I just worked with some of the folks at SAVE on, on how to get those companies who route trucks around to change the route. And so you don't have to get a new designation. You don't have to do any of that. Just get the tom tom to tell the truck to go someplace else, and so um, now you know how to do that. Um, we can we can try it and see. Um, now in 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 this town in Texas, it reduced the truck traffic by 90 percent. Um, maybe it won't be 90 percent here, but if it's 50 or 40, that's that's a big deal. So the trucks used to go through here, and now they they go someplace else. So again, you got all these routes that they could go. Maybe they could go somewhere else. So the next example I want to show you is this little um, um, place called Stockton, built in 1860. It's just like it is in 1860 today, <laughs> it hasn't changed. 
Um, so you've got the town, and then you've got the traffic functions, and then they're, and they're working at odds with one another. It was an old mill town, beautiful place. Um, but the steps come right down into the highway now. So it used to be a narrow street, but now you, like, hello. Like, <coughs> so look at the steps right down. So cars are zooming by, trucks are zooming by, and so there's no really quality of life in the public realm. The highway has just been blown through town. So we did all the, um, the meetings, and we came up with a plan. I'll just show you a couple of things. Um, at one end of town, this is what the intersection looks like. And when we went up to that intersection, it had this beautiful old stonework. And we thought, well, why don't we change that to something that uses stone instead of guardrail and make it a beautiful entrance so that people know they're entering a beautiful place. And then there's some crosswalks which are really hairy right now. And we thought, well, why don't we narrow them and maybe raise them, help the kids cross, use some kind of context-sensitive pillars. And then at the other end of town, I'm just showing you a snapshot. There's um, a couple of buildings that connect across the, the road. There's, they're related. And, but they, you can't cross the street because the cars are going so fast. And so maybe make a, a refuge and an entrance feature to help slow the motorists down as they come into town. Here's a, an example in Germany. So I'm driving along. I'm going 60 miles an hour. And it's totally rural. I have no idea this town is up, coming up because I'm going to a town past it. As I approach the town, the curbs change, or the shoulders change from shoulders to these curbs with a single paving stone. I get a little closer. The paving stones turn to three paving stones, and I can see a little median and sidewalks. I get a little closer. You can see the lights. I can see the first building. The median's there now. I get into town. There's sidewalks, buildings. Um, further into town, now I'm seeing parking. And then I'm right into town, and there's there's what we call a protected bike lane between the cars and the sidewalks. All flush. Uh, there's, no, there's no vertical curbs here. Um, there's the parking row. And I was going 20 miles an hour. And there was no sign saying, slow down, city coming. Um, but the design of the street itself caused me to want to go slower. And I was so impressed, I pulled over and went back and took these photographs. You know, brilliant entry sequence. This is what you want at the beginning and ends of all your towns, you know, to, to inform drivers through design, not a speed trailer, not a cop, but the design of the street itself to inform drivers to behave themselves as they're coming into a town. This is uh, Route 50 in Virginia, hugely historic place. There's these historic markers everywhere, um, all kinds of them. And there's historic buildings everywhere, too. Um, I think Washington slept in every second house here. Um, but he actually did d survey the street. He was a surveyor when he was young. Um, lots of history here. There's the main street, cool bridges, and you know, stone walls that you know, some of the Civil War skirmishes occurred you know, across. And there's Route 50 right there. You know, it's same, same as you guys, beautiful countryside, um, uh, very rural. Um, but the DOT wanted to turn it into you know, a four-lane road. And, and it doesn't take long to figure out what's going to happen. You just have to go up the street closer to Washington. You can see the, the induced um, development that followed those um, highway expansions. Now, the, the DOT, the Virginia DOT, had, had made the main street look just like the highway on each end of town. And it's no wonder drivers are driving fast through here. And, and we noticed similar things uh, today uh, along Route 41. And they already started four-laning in different places, and they, they promised they had no plans to four-lane the freeway. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you already started. Um, oh, yeah, that's, that's like a remnant. We didn't, really didn't mean it. <laughs> you know, you're getting that same story now. Um, you know, every conduit, or what do they call them, culvert, um, is four lanes, just like this. Anyway, so we took a page out of this particular book about traffic through small towns, and the street used to, the main street, the highway used to go through and become the main street. And what happened in Route 50, which is happening here, is the street gets specialized for the throughput and cuts the town in half and disadvantages the businesses. Now, the knee-jerk reaction is to build a bypass. But what usually happens is that this, the miserable street never gets restored back to its, what it was like, because there's, there's never any money for that kind of thing. But what happened in Route 50 was they decided, OK, we're not going to do this. We're going to change the design of the street so that the traffic functions 
and the town functions can coexist. So there was an organization called the Route 50 Cor Corridor Coalition. We did all kinds of plans, and there's the mayor and everyone looking at the maps. There was all kinds of brochures. And so for about 10 years, we fought with the Virginia DOT over this uh, project. We even did a, did a play, an educational play about the, uh, about the, the street. And then reports came out. Um, but what was key, I think, in all of this was the vision. The community had a consensus that they wanted a scenic, unique, rural community in a historical, agricultural, quiet, and natural setting. And that became the litmus test to measure any change against in, in terms of its potential to fulfill or destroy the vision. And if it fulfilled it, the community would support the change. And if it would damage the vision, they would fight the change. And so that, that is, having a vision is absolutely crucial. And then translating that vision to the ground, uh, we have kind of rural speeds between towns, kind of an entry feature, and then town speeds in town, all through those sort of entry sequences. I won't go through the details, but there's one of the entry sequences into Middleburg. It's hard, kind of hard to see, though. There's some rumble strips to, to warn drivers. These are only good away from where people live, though, because they're pretty noisy. And then there's a whole variety of traffic calming measures that reinforce the desired behaviors in the towns. Uh, there's an entry feature. So here's, here's the, what it looks like today, where there's, n there's no entry feature. There's no acknowledgment of the town. And we're going we're gonna to do something to uh, inform motorists that, yeah, you're, you just arrived. This is at a, um, a little T intersection. So we're putting in a median to slow folks down and create a little refuge for drivers going in and out um, for safety purposes, because there's, there's some terrible crashes. And then in, there's the biggest town, even though it's pretty small. Um, again, changing the street in town to be town friendly um, was the key. And there's the plan, and there's all the different measures that are getting employed in that little town. And here's one of the entries, and it will be you know, much enhanced once the, the project goes in. Here's one of the intersections in town. Um, so you know, everyone just speeds up for this intersection. So what we want to do is put in a raised crossing so that there's no real incentive to speed through, put some texture in where the parking <coughs> is. So all of these things got specced in terms of context-sensitive materials and that kind of thing. You know, looking at what, um, what's native to the area informed the designs of all the plans. Here's a crossing where the parking lot for this church is on the other side of the highway. Now, in town, it's called a street, not a highway. <laughs> so this lady's trying to cross the street, but it looks just and behaves like a highway. So we're going to change it into a street so she can cross to the church uh, safely. And then we did some roundabouts as well. And um, there's an aerial photograph of one under construction. Um, and they really helped, uh, tremendous uh, help to the community. And then we had huge support from the hospitality industries, the churches, people interested in taxes, Renew America, Scenic America. Everybody got on board, National Trust for Historic Preservation. There's no downside to good planning somehow. And the last example I want to show you is, is this um, 23122. This is down by um, uh, Jefferson's place, uh, Monticello. <coughs> Monticello. You know, some fantastic um, agricultural landscapes. And this is what the Virginia DOT plans to put through it, a big four-lane highway. And that kind of rubbed the community the wrong way. Um, and this is the VDOT plan to do it. And it's based on these forecasts. And so there's the traffic volumes. And they have these things called um, volume to capacity ratios. And, and their forecast, this is 2005 and this is 2025, claim that these roads will be over capacity and thus they have to do this preemptive move and widen the highway. So here's a glass of water that's half full, half its capacity. Here's a glass of water that's completely full. Um, and here's a glass of water that's over capacity. See all the water sitting up in the air? <laughs> a street's something like that. You can't go over capacity. Um, so th they say it's going to have more traffic than the road can handle. It just can't happen. So in the Route 50 example, in 1970-ish, the Virginia DOT did a forecast and said the 18,000 cars are going to be 
like 32,000 in 20 years. In 1980, they repeated the forecast and said in 20 years, the 18,000 cars are going to grow to, I don't know, 35,000. In um, the 1990s, they did the same thing, same forecast, 30-something thousand. It's always in increments of two lanes, by the way. Um, and it wasn't lost on us in 1995 when we got involved in the project that the forecasts that were done in 1970 didn't come true, or in 80, or in 90. It stayed at 18,000 because that's all the road could handle. And these, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Someone's going to say that you know, there's 20,000 cars on Route 41. Um, according to our model, it's going to be over capacity in the year 2035, so we have to make it four lanes. Um, and then, of course, it will carry 35,000 cars. And they'll go, oh, wow, weren't we clever? Uh, we predicted that. And um, well, we can predict it too. And we can also predict that if it doesn't go to four lanes, it, it can't uh, go over capacity. So just be careful when you get involved with the modeling folks. Um, so when we talked to the people in the Route 231 area, this is what they said they liked about the area, the trees, the views, the history, the character, the scale, the rural qualities. Sound, sound familiar? This is what they didn't like, the speeding, the through trucks, encroachment on their properties, steep edges on the side of the road, getting in and out of driveways is hard, uh, overtaking in, in the wrong places, um, um, maintaining your yard next to the street was hard. So, sound familiar? Um, and then what were they wanted? They wanted the place to stay more or less like it was. They wanted... Um, to do the least intrusive changes. They wanted their identity to be preserved. They wanted increased enforcement, easier use of the intersections, eliminate or discourage the trucks and reduce speeding. Sound familiar? <laughs> like this is the same thing. And so we came up with a whole bunch of ideas for them. Um, now, if you go there, the shoulder edges are, are, are different in places. So there's a fairly steep shoulder. There's a really steep shoulder. There's a steep shoulder. And usually it's a cut and fill thing, so they just fill up the road and it gets really steep. Um, uh, there's a um, pretty straight trajectory. Some of them are gravel, some of them are paved. Um, anyway, they didn't want to widen their shoulders for obvious reasons, they liked the character. And so th this is the condition that really bothered them that they were so high, so they, the idea was just to shorten them. <laughs> like, is that easy? No widening involved, just do that. The texture, um, what they were complaining was that drivers put their minds in neutral and their cars in drive and they can't even feel the road they're on. And so the idea was to change the aggregate in the mix to something that creates texture so they can tell when they're going too fast. Um, and that would be done down the whole quarter. And then the bridges, just like your bridges, are starting to look like this instead of the traditional bridges, you know, with the guardrail and the jersey barriers. And the idea is to, to do things that are context sensitive like that. And you can do the, you can do the ends to make them safe. Um, and you could acknowledge that there's water there and actually tell po folks what they're driving over. And there's standards for this. Like, these aren't like just my idea. These are used all over um, uh, successfully. So those are where all the bridges are. So that would, so you have the texture, and then all the bridges, and then these entry features at each end. So this is this really weird intersection with really strange angles and approaches. Um, the idea was just to do a roundabout, tidy that whole thing up. So that's the end. And then this idea of views and enclosure. Um, there's some wonderful views and so forth along the road. Um, wonderful opportunities. And, and we studied that, and we f where the green parts are is the areas that we wanted to put foliage and um, trees in to, to create a sense of enclosure. And then where those arrows are, we wanted to open up into these spectacular landscapes, just like Olmsted and those guys did in the Bronx River Parkway, to make this experience fantastic uh, when you're driving up and down, to add value to it. And then signs, there's just like sign pollution all over. and so. You're like, can you believe that? Can you even read that when you're driving? Um, so the idea was just to shrink the number of signs, put in um, dark or wooden signposts, and then paint the backs of the signs so that you don't get that silver thing. And that would go all the way down there. 
And then legibility of driveways. Some of them are nicely done. Some of them are almost invisible. So when someone slows down to turn, people don't know why they're doing it. Um, so the idea was, you know, maybe there's a whole variety of treatments. And then some pull-offs. There's only one pull-off on the corridor, and the idea was they need a few more for the, for the tractors that use the road regularly to, to mark historic areas and for police enforcement. There was three places that were identified for pull-offs. And then at the difficult intersections, there was a number of these strange intersections that, um, again, lent themselves to roundabouts, these peculiar angles that were fine um, 80 years ago. You know, sometimes there's something valuable on one side. So the beauty about roundabouts is you can pull it to one side or the other. It doesn't have to be directly in line like signals. And so we could uh, really fit them in nicely. You look at this weird intersection, like holy smoke. Um, this, you know, you've got lots of those. <laughs> um, and so we'll change it to something like that, which allows the whole thing to operate smoothly and safely and beautifully you know, without all the clutter of the of the signals in the queuing. And so there's all the, those little green circles are all the uh, roundabouts. And then the trucks, again, um, there's a bunch of strategies about um, uh, discouraging them through the whole ensemble of all that stuff. It's not the fastest road anymore. It's not a, a substitute to um, other streets. There's the, the option of a ban, but that's really hard to do. There's options of weight limits, but you know, maybe that um, rerouting that um, might help a lot as well. And then um, lastly, I just want to end up with a bit of on the vision. You all have a collective imagination of what this place should be like 100 years from now. Um, and the idea is to, to do something about that now so that you can actually achieve that vision. And maybe it might look like something like this, where all the little towns are along the way with rural in between, you know, like happened happened for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and here's just a few starter ideas. I don't know if they're any good or not, but they're, they're ideas. Here's Avondale. Maybe there's a, an entry feature on the way in. You know, there's some really complex intersections that can be tidied up with roundabouts. Maybe another entry feature at the other end. Maybe some raised intersections down that speedway through town. You know, this is a you know, quick sketch on what it might look like on the way in. This is that cumbersome intersection that could get tidied up so nicely. Um, this is through town where the, the bridge is. You know, maybe it could actually look like a bridge again. Um, you know, it could, you could really do some cool stuff, maybe get some art, art worked in. And here's along the way uh, where folks are going too fast. Maybe we could help the pedestrians cross the street and slow things down at the same time. You know, maybe there as well. You know, at the other end of town. Here's Chatham. Um, maybe there's some things we can do with the bridges, some of the intersections. So here's coming into town, there's the bridge at the bottom. Maybe it looks like a bridge with some kind of entry feature, warning folks they're coming into a, a nice place. This um, weird angle intersection, um, maybe it could be tightened up, slowed down, made beautiful, made walkable. Um, Maybe parking can be put back to help businesses and residents and so forth. So this really, really um, kind of open speedway type thing could get tightened up into something that could um, be conducive to town life again. Maybe down at the other bridge, you know, you could do some bridge architecture, maybe celebrate the fact there's water going under there with a bit of a contour. And this is, um, you know, you know the, it's got the endless driveway on the side where there's no definition. You know, maybe that could get tidied up so that the street doesn't look so much like just a, a runway. And, you know, so those are just some ideas that apply the, the thoughts that I went through tonight that might help achieve some vision. But again, that's your call. It's your decision. It's your vision. Um, now, for some people, this is a big paradigm shift. <laughs> Um, because you know, we've been taught to, to value modernist thinking. Um, but I hope tonight I've showed you that traditional thinking tends to repair the damage that modernist thinking has done to, to cities, villages, and, and rural areas. So that's, the, that's what I hope to become um, kind of a popular paradigm. 
so with that, um, I would just encourage you to stay involved. Um, if this is important to you, get involved somehow. If you're too busy, um, there's professional people who you can pay to do this for you. Um, write letters, um, do whatever you can. Uh, because I, I think that there are far too few pieces of rural America left. You know, when, you, when you look around the country and, and you see this ubiquitous um, arterial type look up and down these old corridors, at these old farm to market roads, it's, it's a real shame. And, and um, it's this generation's time to, to step up. And if we leave it to the next generation, it's going to be way, way harder to to undo this stuff. It's almost impossible to undo it. So now's the time, and I, I, I wish you all the best. And um, maybe we could take some questions and answers and discussion. Thank, thank you very much. Um, the question is, am I atypical, or is there a lot of people who think like me? Um, I was atypical 15 years ago. But I think there's more and more people that think like me. Um, I think that a lot of DOTs are starting to, to start thinking more like this. I think that the conventional thinkers are, are losing their um, monopoly on, on rural roads and city design because their model hasn't worked. Um, I can't think of one successful example, actually, of a a city that fully embraced modern values that's a good city still. Uh, or a, a countryside that embraced modern values that's still good. So their model failed, and I think more and more people are realizing that. And so I think there's a whole new, whole new generations of planners and engineers who are starting to think like this. Um, our firm was just one of the early adopters. Um, so let's work our way across. Yes, sir? Yeah, uh, Richard Gaw, Chester County Press. I'm just curious to know. Um, you talked a lot this evening about modernist and conventional thought versus traditional approaches to development. I'm curious to know if you've met with any representatives from PennDOT related to the Route 41 corridor. Um, not this trip, but previously. And um, I've met with them on other projects since then. And any and reception has been one. Yeah, I think, I think PennDOT is evolving. I think the leadership in particular is, is, is getting much better. Um, I think they're adopting better policies. I think it's a, a good thing that they're low on funds right now because when they when they had a lot of money, they would they would do. If they had a lot of money, this road would be widened already. At my, it would be my bet. But because of that, in fact, a lot of DOTs are strapped for money now because they can't even maintain what they have. Um, so they're not going to build more of it. Um, they're becoming a maintenance organization. And so they're being forced to do smarter approaches to transportation. So I think that's happening here. I think the DVRPC, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the area, understands that. New Jersey, who shares that same MPO, is in the same boat. They ran out of money years ago and are adopting smarter ways of doing things. So, so I'm, I'm hopeful that the, um, the DOT would go along with this sort of thing. Uh, the key is to, uh, the medical analogy is to, s to do no more further harm um, with these, this incrementalism that's going on right now in the corridor with the culverts and other things that, that set up the trajectory for the four lane. And that's where I would start intervening. And I would also start doing things that reinforce the two lane idea. So you need a plan and you need, so you can say, hey, yeah, this is consistent with our two lane plan and we want to start implementing it. And it's a whole lot cheaper than building a four-lane um, road, and, and it's a lot healthier in the long run on all sorts of levels. But I think the DOT is getting far, far better. Yes, sir? And we'll go over here. Um, one thing I would like, one, one of the issues, of course, is that transportation planning is done at the state level, and land planning is done at the township level. So there's uh, a disparity in clout between the two. But um, I'm involved with the Route 896 traffic and safety improvement project somehow. And um, I think if the local governments 
kind of dig in their heels and insist that the DOT does a better job, you can squeeze better uh, design out of them, but you have to know what better design is because they will give you the easiest possible design for them, not the best design for you. So you have to kind of dig in your heels and, and squeeze it out of them. And then um, you have to be able to carry that vision through successive generations of community leaders because, you know, uh, turnover is fast and in community, in township government and the, these ideas get lost quickly and, you know, you're back to, back to uh, mm -hmm. traffic engineers doing what they want to do instead of what the, what the community needs. That's a really good um, observation. Um, in fact, you, you have to be vigilant for generations probably until the DOTs completely change. Because you're right, the, the conventional approaches are easy for them to do. All their standards, all the funding mechanisms. The, the, by the way, the engineers, when you think about all the professionals who embraced modernism, the design professionals, the only design professionals who, who nailed it were the engineers. They developed a completely common vocabulary, which is shared right across the country. They have um, common value sets. They have set up a huge funding mechanism. Architects, landscape architects, and everyone else didn't do anything close. Um, the momentum, though, that that has created with all the standards and so forth being in place is, is, a, is a really hard thing to steer. Well, the, and, standards, so. well, the feds are probably um, doing the best job of, of allowing DOTs to change, you know, with the flexibility in uh, the Federal Highway's flexibility in highway building and, you know, there's a number of publications about how to interpret the, the Green Book. The Green Book is the, like the Bible of um, street design and, and it can be interpreted the way that I interpreted it through a lot of those projects or it can be interpreted the way that a lot of conventional DOTs interpret it and it all fits. So there's a lot of flexibility in there and those federal books are, are encouraging um, DOTs and practitioners to exploit the full flexibility inherent in the guidelines. There's, there's yet to be a project that I, I couldn't do and, and with, um, within the, those guidelines. Now where those guidelines are silent, what did I, in the past, they're, they're getting better all the time, but when they were silent, you would go to international standards and so forth if you're doing something you know, truly innovative. But I think the, um, I think the feds have, have um, done a lot to open the doors for the DOTs, and I, I think it's really an issue of the community articulating the vision, because then there's legislation about how um, public participation has to happen, how the environmental assessments have to happen, include all the options. And, and I think if you have a vision and a plan, that'll go a whole long way to having your vision achieved. Um, the middle management's always been the issue in transportation, I think, um, at the district levels and at the DOT. But that's getting better, too. Um, so the longer you can hold off the damage, the easier it's going to be. <laughs> but I would, I would suggest you don't wait. I think you should be proactive about it. And, um, and get on with making the, the two-lane thing the plan, along with a um, compatible land use direction too, and, and not be in a position where you, know, you get a, a tremendous amount of sprawl pressure to, to, um, to do a conventional four-lane road. And we had some comments. Yes, yeah, ma'am. On the uh, Highway 50 project, it looks more expensive. I mean, I was just down in Middleburg a couple of weeks ago, and I mean, I was astonished at the all the, you know, and all the different projects, you know, all the, the, the masonry that was done. That's not more expensive than the four lane? It is a tiny fraction of the cost. Really? Oh, yeah. It's pennies to the dollar. Um, the right of way is the big cost. Um, and then you've got, to, you've got to build a four lane road. Right. instead of just retrofitting an existing two-lane road. So it's, it's a tiny cost. And the cost doesn't stop with the capital stuff. You've got to then maintain that. And we're not maintaining the roads we have. And then it creates the sprawl and then all the health, health outcomes and the environmental outcomes. The costs, to, you just keep on paying with, um, 
with the suburban model. And, and how did they manage to convince the Virginia Department of Transportation to go for the two lane model? I mean, because Route 66 is parallel to it, so why do they need to be using Route 50, frankly? Well, there's two questions there. The it was a 10 year battle or so with the um, Virginia DOT, and they tried everything in the book to stop the project, to take away the funding, to you know, you name it. Um, the, and, and then it became a, it, everything's political. So it eventually became a political issue and Senator Warner um, got involved and he kind of blessed it and a lot of the, the local politicians and county politicians got involved. Senator Graham from West Palm Beach got involved, a Democrat and a Republican, an urban and a rural. That's why we got so much done in West Palm Beach and in Route 50, that was the national urban model and this was, Route 50 was the national uh, rural model. And the idea was that other folks could copy it, which has happened in both cases. And so they got the, the, the funding to make it happen over, over VDOT's objections. But today, now even VDOT has evolved. Um, they now look at that project as a sterling example of context sensitive design, which they're very proud of. Now if they could only think of it more than just a one of, and then apply it everywhere else, that's the next leap. But they've come a long way. Um, roundabouts, they resisted the roundabouts. And um, they work beautifully. The, the uh, safety, the, the, the queuing, and, and the fact you can go down this, this street in your car and, and not get stuck, stop. It, it's not in the context. It, these rural roads are about going through respectfully and, and enjoying the countryside. And the, and the roundabouts just fit in. So um, it was a hard job, but it, the firsts are always the hardest. When you're pioneering an idea, it's always the hardest. And it's been done, and, and it's been done a couple times now. So the, the ground has been set, prepared for you guys um, from, because of those other projects. At the back, sir? In those examples I showed earlier, you know, a round roundabout fit in somewhere. Sometimes we had to push it off. The, the beauty about roundabouts is they're very, very flexible. Uh, if there is a building up to the street, um, you, know, you, you can't put the roundabout on top of it unless you take the building down. So you have to move the roundabout over. Um, now roundabouts take room at the intersection, but they actually save land because with signals, you actually have more paved surface with all the turn lanes and storage lanes. So it's actually less impervious surface, but it's just concentrated in a dot rather than strung out down all the approaches. Now sometimes um, if there's a constraint on opposite corners, you can do what's called a peanut about. Um, or, an, or they come in different shapes. And um, Now one of the sections that I deleted from my slideshow, I, I put at the end and I can actually show you a a picture of it. It'll just take a second to get to, but so I took the, out the section on roundabouts, um, but they're really easy to cross and to, and they're friendly, to, and you can get trains through them. But what I want to show you, oh, and the reason about interchanges and stuff now, big interchanges and in arterials. Um, but what I want to show you is this one. <laughs> now the constraint here was it's very expensive to build on top of a 
a, a big road like that. So this, to, to the left here, is the first half of a roundabout, and the, this way is the second half, and it's a two-lane roundabout. But in the middle, it's kind of pinched like a balloon, um, and we call them peanut aboats. Um, so that's what one looks like. This is, um, I can't remember the name of the city, but it's just out, out west. Um, and here's uh, three peanut aboats in a row. Um, so they work just like a roundabout. So if there, in, if there was a, if this were a, a um, T intersection, there were some buildings in the way, you could squeeze it down and, and, and still, get the, um, still get the roundabout effect. And sometimes you need an oval about, like if the, um, you know, so they, they don't have to be round. That's the, I guess roundabout's probably the, a bad term, isn't it? It should be a me boat. <laughs> so it can change shape. So yeah, you can, you can, they're, they're flexible, but sometimes they just don't fit. So you just have to be realistic. It's like sometimes in the little towns, like in, in the middle of Middleburg, it was uh, too constrained, so you couldn't fit. But out along Route 41, I, I bet you'd be, you'd be hard pressed to find an intersection that you couldn't make a roundabout work in. And I can't count how many we went through and said, well, this would be a great place for a roundabout. You know, there's all the cars and trucks stopped for no, no reason. And, and I don't know how many people in the room speed up for a stale green light. You know, you see a green light, you didn't see it change. You think, ooh, maybe I should speed up so I don't get caught at the red. You know, I could see some of you smiling. <laughs> you know who you are. Um, and has anybody sped up for a yellow light? Like everybody? And, and so, particularly in towns and villages, that is really dangerous. That's how people get killed, because you get those T-bone crashes, and, and we, we heard about a couple of them in the corridor. Um, no one speeds up for a roundabout. So they reduce crash rates, they reduce, in, you know, by about 50% or more. They reduce injuries and deaths by probably 70, 80%. Um, they reduce energy consumption, they reduce noise. You don't have to power them. Child literacy goes up 25%. Teenage pregnancy <laughs> drops. Like, like there's, there's just no downside to these things. So, so, so any other uh, questions? Yes, sir. You gave really good talk, and we appreciate your uh, your perspective and expertise. You know, we we get the sense that uh, of 41, the truck truck traffic is increasing, the and the through traffic is increasing. And I, I get your point about the capacity is the capacity, but but it's it's hard to uh, to to see how that uh, problem of through traffic and truck tra traffic is going to change. Uh, I guess if you make the road unattractive, they, they won't use it. But uh, that, that seems, thinking of the entire area, that seems to be a, uh, a very difficult, almost insurmountable barrier for our planners and for our, our larger community. Yeah, that's a good point. The, the question is if we, you know, there's so much truck traffic and, and it appears to be growing, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, and to change the design of the street to make it you know, less, less like that um, seems insurmountable. I think there is, there is a, a cultural leaning towards rewarding the long trip, rewarding the truck trip, you know, for all sorts of conventional you know, rhetoric reasons. You know, you gotta keep the goods movement going, you know, that kind of thing, even though it's damaging your own economy. Um, you know, I think um, it's, the way we word it is important. Um, if, we, if we redesign the street in incrementally to reward more traffic and more truck traffic, you're going to get more truck traffic and traffic. If you, instead of making it unattractive for that, why don't you instead say that we want to make it more attractive for local trips, walking trips. We want to make it safer through um, more appropriate speeds. Yeah, I would focus on what you're doing positively for the place and your towns and your rural areas. Um, and the, the other side of that is the abuse that's going on, the, the, the cut through and so forth, and, the, and that, will, that will diminish. Yeah, obviously, that's, that's the appropriate political message or the message to, to uh, in terms of the political 
uh, issue here, and a very good one, and you made it very clear. And thank you for reminding me. Yeah, that's, that's the critical message, but I also think it's consistent with your vision. And so I, I think it's more than, um, it's more than politics. It's, 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 it's your collective imagination of what this place ought to be like put into policy and then put into design. I th and that's, that's the stronger message. That's the will of the people, like Jefferson said, that this wants to happen. If you sit back, the alternative vision is this incremental, you know, another cut, another cut, and then there's a thousand cuts, and, and then you've lost your resource. And that's the alternative vision. And so I, th I think a community vision would be hugely helpful here. And that becomes your touchstone, where you, where you can measure if something is right or wrong. And then it's a matter of getting the word out to your, your friends and your, your neighbors and, um, and even the people who have moved in into some of these tract home developments, these suburban developments here, they're now here. They're not going anywhere, but they're here because this is a beautiful place. And they, even though they live in a place that's probably contributing traffic but not much else to, the, to Route 41, um, they appreciate their environment. And the suburbs are always nice until they reach, I don't know, 60% build out. And then everyone says, roll up, you know, stop because it starts getting worse after that. So before you get to that, and I don't know if you've got there already, but um, you know, just that's water under the bridge and, and then bring them on board, move forward with all those folks um, because that helps and then it helps everybody. We'll go start at the right and go back again. So go here and then here. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about the truck traffic. Basically, trucks are going to be on the roads, and I'm not going to say that they shouldn't be on the roads, but they need to be on the roads and be respectful and make it safe for everyone because we do have farmers. We are all in smaller cars, or some of us. And the just truck ratio of weight is dangerous. So if they slow, and I think you taught me years ago, Ian, that you can get the same amount of traffic through a given area at 45 miles an hour, which makes it safer. Is that not correct? And Well, anyways, it's, it's about being respectful and being safe and we do love this rural area, and we have done a lot to ease and try to protect and save our agricultural um, heritage here. And it's important as a national security issue, I believe, and so does Bill Grassi of uh, American Farmland Trust, because one day maybe we really will have to feed ourselves in this country. Yeah, when energy gets expensive, again, it won't be. You can't just import things from all over anymore. You have to grow it near, near where you live. The, um, yeah, the only thing worse than a truck going through your town is a truck going through your town at 55 miles an hour. <laughs> you know, they really should be going through respectfully. And so, th yeah, they're in the mix. It'd be nice to get the volumes down, but um, they don't, a truck doesn't have to go through your community at, um, at, at what speed they choose. Yes, sir. Uh, you had identified uh, one of the problems I think we certainly have most prevalent in our northern corridor is the, we've been calling it a lot, the maintenance widening that they're doing to us. Mm -hmm. Is there one key element that you've seen in some of your other programs that we should be addressing or a way that we can stand up and reject that as the model moving forward for PennDOT? Yeah, the, you know, when there's lots of excuses to widen a road. Um, one is to increase the car carrying capacity and the, the trucks going through. Uh, but when that starts to fail, um, you need other excuses. So safety, who can argue against a safety project, right? It just happens to end up being a four-lane section. Um, I think it, the key is to call them out on it and um, perhaps in your plan have some guidelines on what things ought to look like, like a culvert and a bridge and a cross-section. So when there is a project to be done or an intersection, you can say, okay, according to our community guidelines, which we've adopted you know, four years ago or what have you, this is, this is the pattern that we want to follow. So at the end of the day, it adds up to the vision, which is the whole point. And what's happening now is these, these widenings, for whatever excuse, are going to add up to a four-lane road, just like the example I showed that I, that I photographed today. So you've got a vision that's happening right now, a four-lane vision that's happening right now, that's getting built right now. 
Um, so you need to substitute that with your vision. Um, but yeah, you just got to call them out on that and, and, and point it out, you know, and, and educate your neighbors about the, what's really going on. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, for several local mun municipalities, much of their funding is dedicated or having to be dedicated to other goods and services uh, and functions throughout the townships. So many of our township leaders are sort of at a stranglehold because um, they don't have the funding themselves to pay for this, this vision. I was curious to know, you gave some great examples of, of, uh, of uh, you know, smart growth, smart vision, smart uh, infrastructure improvements uh, in terms of traffic, uh, et cetera. In those examples, um, who paid for these, for those, for those projects? <coughs> Where did um, the funding come from? For the Route 51, it started with um, a local organization um, run by an artist who, who got donations and created the Route 50 Co Corridor Coalition. They, they, a lot of them were volunteers, but there was some paid staff, but they relied on um, donations from the community. Uh, then the Piedmont Environmental Council came in, who also rely on donations, and they helped fund, they were like a pass-through nonprofit group to help fund the Route 50 Cor Corridor Coalition. Eventually, when the project got a certain way and became um, kind of inevitable for the Virginia DOT, they had funding that came from the federal government to help pay for it. So that went through the Virginia DOT. And at the beginning, they tried everything possible to, to use the funding for other things and take away the funding and so forth. But ev eventually, the community vision prevailed, and they had to use it for the project. Um, the Stockton project, that, that effort was funded by the New Jersey DOT themselves. Um, let's see, the Route 231, 22, that was also funded by the local community through donations from the community and the Piedmont Environmental Council. Um, so there's lots of different ways of getting funding through grants as well. Um, but yeah, it does cost. But the cost of not doing it is even higher, which is, I think. Oh, getting yeah. the science, yeah. So thanks again, everybody.